and just getting to think about mercy, God's mercy and how I did not deserve it. I was mm -hmm. so guilty, you know, that I standing before him, I didn't have, I had nothing. I had no excuse. I had no defense, but Jesus, you know, walked into that courtroom and he, you know, took my place. He took my punishment and how much I didn't deserve it. And it was given, Amen. it was a gift. It wasn't something I was entitled to, but I just thank God for his mercy. That's so this good. one's called Mercy Walked In. <laughs> Such a blessing. Oh, mercy and faith. Mm -hmm. Mercy and faithfulness. faithfulness. Really good. That's you see good. that there's some scriptures, you know, that talk about, you know, his mercy, he's merciful and faithful or mercy and faithfulness. You know, they do, they do go together and yes, they're, they're all parts of the attributes of God and how we've been talking about that. And so um, before we get started, we'll just have a word of prayer and just ask the Lord blessing on the study tonight. And if anybody has a prayer request to throw out there, feel free to throw it yeah. out there and, and we'll pray about yeah. it. But if not, we'll just. We'll just pray. All right. Lord, thank you for this time that we could come together as ladies and get around your word. I thank you for this study about bringing quietness to our souls. It's been mm -hmm. such a help to me, God. I pray that it's been a help to the ladies. It's just been so good to be able to put aside some of the things of the world during this time and to be able to focus upon you and upon, upon these attributes that you have and who you are, what you are, Lord Jesus. I just pray that it would be very real tonight, uh, your mercy and your faithfulness. Thank you for your love that we talked about last week. And I just pray that these things will become um, part of our what we believe about you, that we'll be firm in that so that we can be quiet and not have all of these doubts and the fears and things in our soul that sometimes make us unstable as Christians and unable to fulfill your will. And just want to pray that you'll meet the need of each lady's heart tonight. Help it to be an encouragement and a challenge. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. We're going to turn first tonight to Psalm 89. So if you'll go with me to Psalm 89. I will put our... Oh, one second here. <laughs> Got to get the PowerPoint going. And so Psalm 89 verses one and two, and it says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. 
With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. What a wonderful, what wonderful verse is talking really about the mercies verse. of the Lord and the faithfulness of him and how it, he's faithful. I'm going to make known thy faithfulness to all generations. And God says he's going to establish, he's established, his faithfulness is established in the very heavens. And talking about the mercy of God, mercy, you know, that benevolence, mildness or tenderness of heart, which disposes a person to overlook injuries or to treat an offender better than he deserves. Mm -hmm. The disposition that tempers justice and induces an injured person to forgive trespasses and injuries and to forbear punishment. Or, I like this, inflict less than law or justice will warrant. In this sense, there is perhaps no word in our language precisely synonymous with mercy. That which comes nearest to us to it is grace. Uh, mercy implies benevolence, tenderness, mildness, pity or compassion, and clemency, but exercised only towards offenders. Mercy is a distinguishing attribute of the supreme being. And that's the 1828 Dictionary of Mercy. And so I thought, wow, there's a lot in that. Um, but when we start thinking mm -hmm. about mercy today, I never realized this, but it's true. When we talk about mercy today, we think in our culture, there's a misunderstanding when it comes to mercy. We think that the meaning of mercy today is um, giving everybody, a, giving them a second chance or mm -hmm. saying, oh, well, I've got to, you know, I'm going to, I'm just, I'm just going to wipe out all the consequences. You know, you see a lot of um, school officials, state prosecutors, mm -hmm. parents, you know, they're saying, you're not, you're, you're unmerciful if you don't yeah. let a guilty person off the hook, mm. you know, just, well, don't they, don't you think they need a second chance? And he said he was sorry. And if you've forgiven someone, why do, why do you let him suffer? Or why does he have to be punished? I don't understand. Right. And so, you know, as a result of that, we're seeing in our culture today, because of this, this misconception, we're making what we're, we're, we're equating mercy with tolerance, tolerating sin, rather than saying, wait a minute, That's wait right. a minute you know, there has to be, you know, some balance here to say, mm -hmm. yes, sometimes mercy does overlook. Other times there are still going to be consequences for offenses That's or good. for sin. Yeah. But that doesn't mean we're unmerciful. Doesn't mean, you know, that God's mm -hmm. unmerciful. And so today we have all kinds of problems. We have, you know, adulterous pastors that are allowed to return to pulpits, school board members, you know, that are tied, mm -hmm. you're know, tying the hands of the administrators in schools, you know, when, when disciplinary matters, you're, you got parents now that again, believe that they, that to be loving and merciful to their children, they have to rescue them from all of the consequences of their bad actions or their sins. And so the kids never learn responsibility, never right. learn that there are consequences for sin. And so we've got a lot of problems today because we have perverted that word mercy. Mm -hmm. And so even in our, our churches today, we have to be careful. We can take a verse like 1 John 1, 9, and it's true. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive mm -hmm. us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But sometimes we equate with the forgiveness. We think, well, that means God's just going to wipe out all the consequences, you know, and I just get to start mm -hmm. with a clean slate. Yes, he forgives and he doesn't hold our sin over our head, right. you know, and say, well, remember what you did last week. God doesn't do that. But sometimes there are natural wheels of consequence or things right. in the spiritual laws that we violated when we sinned. Mm -hmm. And that's still going to happen. The consequences are still sometimes going to come. Sometimes God will make the, the consequences less when we're repentant and we have the right heart, but we have to be careful that we don't think that, again, just by, by confessing it, that, oh, everything's just going to go right back to the yeah. way it was, you yeah. know, and God wouldn't be a good God. He wouldn't be a good father any more than we are with our children. If we teach our yes. children that, that, oh, we're just going to wipe out your consequences every time. But when they get out in the world, someday they're going to find out that's not really the way the world works. Mm -hmm. There's certain things that's that right. when you sin, you know, and, and those sins become mm -hmm. big enough or bad enough or serious enough, you're going to land yourself in jail or in some serious <laughs> trouble. You mm -hmm. know, you're not always going to be able to rescue your children from those consequences. Yeah. And God doesn't do that. He wants us to realize that sin is bad and destructive. And if he just, you know, whoop, like a genie, you know, just uh -huh. wiped away all the consequences, poof, with a magic wand, you know, every time we just say, I, you know, I'm sorry, or just confess it, we wouldn't learn. God wouldn't no. be a good father that way. We have to That's learn right. that. He wants us to know how bad sin is and what it does to us. So we've got to think about how God, you know, administers mercy and how he looks at mercy because it's so easy to just look at it, you know, the way the world looks at it or the right. way we, sometimes we have it in our minds, we don't even realize it. Right. Ezra 9, <laughs> 13 and 14. Okay. After all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that 
Um, our God has punished us. Notice what I highlighted there, less than our iniquities deserve. Ooh. We just read this this week, wow. Bible Baptist ladies, yeah. you know, in Ezra. Uh -huh. And has given us such deliverance as this. Should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Ooh. Like, are we going to really yeah. do that again after God has showed us so much mercy? Like, man, we could have yes. been in a lot worse trouble, right. a lot worse problems if we hadn't, you know, God hadn't shown us mercy. Right. So that's his attitude. You know, we yeah. see in this verse that mercy is defined by God is giving us less consequences yeah, sometimes for our sin than we deserve, right. not necessarily eliminating them entirely. Right. We know that's God good. can if he chooses to yes. do that. But like I said, most times he's teaching us through the consequences of our sins to be obedient children. That's right. And if there are no consequences, we're not going to learn very good mm -mm. about being his child. That's good. And Numbers 14, 18 says, the Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Because God does not eliminate the consequences of sin, does this mean that he's not merciful? You know, God goes mm -hmm. on to explain in verses 20 through 23 in that chapter that though he's pardoned their iniquity, those, though, over, those that were over 20, you know, of the children of Israel at that time who had seen God's miracles, who did not believe, God said, you're not mm -hmm. going into the land because of unbelief other than Joshua and Caleb. Mm -hmm. um, the consequences remain, but it said that he did pardon their iniquity. So was God unmerciful in this situation? Was he unmerciful to David when David had consequences, you know, the rest of his life after murdering Uriah uh, or not allowing Moses to enter the promised land after striking the rock rather than speaking to it? Was God unmerciful for expelling Adam and Eve from the garden and cursing mm -hmm. their labors, even though they obviously faced their sin right. and they accepted his skins of covering for their nakedness? You know, is God unmerciful to us because, you know, he arranges these extended consequences for his people, even after he forgives their sin? You know, these questions can really trouble us unless we understand God's view of mercy. And so if we can understand this about how God doesn't give us the full consequences of our sins, but we don't see that always. We don't understand that. We just see yes. the trouble that we're going through. And we know sometimes that our sin has caused it. And we're just like, well, God, you could make it better. You know, I am really sorry. And, but God's saying, yeah, but if you could see what really would have come your way, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times we just don't, I have not gotten a hold of how merciful God has been in my life. And just trying to understand that. And so you get noisy inside. I've been noisy inside. And so mm -hmm. even though, you know, we still have to face the consequences of our sin, if we come with God and understand his mercy to say, you know what, God, I know you're a merciful God. I know you're not giving me and you haven't given me all I deserve. I deserve right. hell. I know that. That's right. Um, and you're not giving me all that I deserve here. Help me to trust you and rest in that. And again, with his faithfulness. And, and have a peace, then we can have a peace in his That's forgiveness good. and in his love. Like we talked about last week, knowing he's a loving God and that he does love us and that there's mm -hmm. nothing that we can do that'll make him love us less. Even though right. we feel that way, we kind of like, oh man, how could God possibly love me? You know, after we have sinned against him and we realize yeah. how we failed him. Yeah. And we can never do anything that will make him love us more. His right. love stays the same. It's constant. It's part of his you know, his goodness and his faithfulness, wow. you know, is saying he did, that God doesn't change. So he, he can't change. His love can't change. His mercy, you know, can't change. And so it's amazing. Yeah. As we rest in him, we've got to get a hold of the depth of our sin, you know, and how deeply it's offended yeah. God and understand that, mm. um, you know, think about what our sin you know, warrants in Romans 7, 30, 13, it talks about that, that sin by the commandment might be exceeding sinful. And this mm -hmm. was my problem for a long time with the things that I've been wrestling with that have made me so noisy, you know, anxious, you know, and, and just kind of frustrated and having that oh, in my life for so long was I wasn't seeing that as exceeding sinful. I just thought, oh, it's my circumstances. It's this in my life. It's that in my life. If right. I could just fix these things, you know, I won't mm -hmm. be like that at this anymore. I won't feel this way anymore. Right. But God says, no, you need to get with me. Exceeding means great. In, in, to a great degree, do I realize how great my sin is before him? Yeah. You know, and what mm. sin earns us? And what have our sins earned us? Let's remember that. I need to remember that. You need to remember mm. that. You know, wow. our sins, because we've sinned against God, we are we deserve eternal torment in hell forever yes. because we have sinned against a holy God. 
you know, that's an eternal right. God, there, there has to be eternal punishment for that. That's what I deserve. Mm. And it's hard to get, you know, people to that place now, you know, yeah. nowadays where they real, really realize I am a sinner and I deserve this. That's a hard thing to face, yeah. you know, and right. understanding that. And then understanding, you know, that I deserve to be cut off from fellowship with God because he yeah. cannot stand sin, how much he hates mm -hmm. sin, how sin just, you know, is an abomination to him. Yes. So he really, I mean, he's justified to completely cut me off and say that that's enough. You know, mm -hmm. I deserve that after sinning, especially after salvation, because after salvation, I have the spirit of God dwelling in me. No excuses. Sin is truly now a crime against God, even right. more so than before salvation when I was yes. so in bondage to it, where we don't right. have the spirit of God to help us mm -hmm. overcome it. And so God has every right to just cut me off, not fellowship with me, That's right. talk, never talk to me again. You know, mm -hmm. and sometimes I can talk myself into that and, and saying, you know, when I'm not in fellowship with him, well, see, he's not talking to me or see, he's not, huh. but it's me, right. not him. He's, right. he hasn't moved. He hasn't changed. That's good. And then, you know, we deserve the suffering. Okay. The physical and emotional suffering that we go through in this life are part of the consequences of sin on this right. world. We see it all around us. That's why we have sickness. That's why we have the yeah. wars. Mm -hmm. That's why we have, you know, the pestilences like the, the COVID virus. We have all of these things that are a part of sin and, and consequences yes. of our sin. And again, God could send all those things in and just, you know, literally wipe us out, you know, but he promised he would never send another worldwide flood. You know, he's still, he's whole withholding and still having yeah. mercy, even in the things that he has to judge as he judges sin in our world That's right. and even in our own hearts and lives. Um, another thing that was interesting, it's just kind of a side note with this, but I found it was very interesting about God's mercy, looking at these things about, you know, the eternal torment in hell forever, the cutoff from fellowship with God and the suffering. Um, if you look at God now, if, if you went to an, uh, an emergency room, if a doctor in an emergency room has two patients come at this in at the same time, one has a broken arm and one is having a heart attack. We, we all know that the doctor is going to treat the heart attack, you know, before mm -hmm. the broken arm. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, because the heart attack, that's a life or death situation. And so they're going to treat that first. Right. And so, of course, we would say that's the most life-threatening. We're going to give the most attention. The doctor's going to do that first. And the person with the broken arm might be like, well, I'm in pain too. And they are. And the doctor's concerned about them too, but not to the extent that he is about the, the heart attack victim. And God is the same way. First and foremost, with his mercy and his concern, you know, he is most concerned about those that are lost and, you know, he wants to save them from their eternal death. This is life or death situation. And that's mm -hmm. where he wants us to be focused as Christians too. Right. It, that's a spiritually life-threatening condition. That's where our focus should be. Our concern should be on the lost. Mm -hmm. That's why God gave us the great commission. He's very focused on that, that this yes. needs to be a priority because of the spiritual peril they're in. You know, they're dead in their right. sins and they must be made alive unto God. This is a desperately important situation. Then next, God is concerned with those who are, are out of fellowship with him. You know, they're living uh, away from the umbrella of his protection, maybe outside the sheepfold. He's concerned about that because he knows that when you're outside of that protection, you know, that he's provided there and you're outside of living his, his commandments, you're in trouble because you're going right. to be spiritually crippled. Satan's going to come after mm. you. You're going to end up having some really bad consequences for your sin. And you're mm -hmm. going to end up being handicapped spiritually. No, you can't lose your salvation. No, you're not eternally, you know, um, get tormented in hell, but you can have that where you're going to be cut off from fellowship with God yes. and God's concerned about that. Yeah. So he wants that, you know, to people to be reconciled to him that have, that have gone away from him mm. that are not walking with him. And then lastly, God is concerned and he does want to have mercy and he is concerned about our physical and emotional suffering. You know, right. it's not to minimize the pain, just like the person with the broken arm. You don't minimize the pain that they're going through. And God doesn't minimize the pain that we're going to through mm -hmm. when it's physical. It's very real. And because we're in this body and we're suffering every day and you're feeling that pain and the health problems and in, if you can feel like it's never going to end mm -hmm. and it's, it's very real, you know, we, but, and we tend to really focus upon that physical and emotional suffering that we go through in this life and focus all our efforts on, you know, God, please rescue me from this health condition. Please deliver me from this physical problem. But we got to remember that this too shall pass. It's a, it's a temporary problem that last one. That's right. why it's down at the bottom of the list there, because it is a temporary problem. One day God right. knows when we're in heaven with him away from the very presence of sin, those problems are going to be taken care of. 
yes. instantly. So God, it's not that God isn't concerned and we shouldn't, we should be concerned again. It's not to minimize and not to say we shouldn't be praying for those things. Mm -hmm. But I know through the years in ministry that a lot of times, you know, our prayer lists, whether they're personal prayer lists or church prayer lists, you know, and the requests that are given a lot of times we put a lot of focus on the physical problems. And again, doesn't mean we should not pray for these things we need to, and I'm not minimizing that. And I'm not saying don't mention those, mm -hmm. but it's sad that comparatively we have comparatively few requests on our prayer lists for lost souls, you know, maybe our, you know, lost friends and family, mm -hmm. um, the prodigals, you know, and, and having concern for that. Are we concer as concerned and burdened for those things as we are right. for, our, for the physical problems around That's us? Good. Because again, those physical problems one day, they're going to be taken care of. And as serious as, as it is, as serious as this COVID virus is, it's still only a temporal thing. And one day, you know, we have an eternity to face and God wants us to focus on those things. And so God's mercy, you know, we can feel like, well, God, yes. you know, you're not hearing God's like, I'm concerned about your physical problems, but mm -hmm. focus on the spiritual things because right. those are more important. And it can be hard to do that, you know, when we're distracted with all these physical problems, but we've got to mm -hmm. remember what God has changed and how he's removed our condemnation. You know, he rescues us, not just initially at salvation, but throughout our life, you know, he's, he shows us. And let's remember what he's changed for us. He's done some amazing things, you know, Ooh, and we've got to remember that his mercy, we don't have a right to his mercy. Mm. I, I think I can get yeah. like that sometimes where I feel like I'm entitled right. to a second chance with God rather than truly believing and being mm. humbled by the fact that God's mercy is a gift that is yes. granted to us, you know, his, wow. and it's part of his goodness. Mm. And then and whatever he decides is best when we accept that. And I think sometimes, um, whether maybe you were saved out of, you know, a life of deep sin and, and issues where you know, you know, how bad your sin was and you had to go really deep into that sin or whether maybe you were saved like I was as a young mm -hmm. person, but I had a time where I did walk away, you know, went away from God. I was still in church, but my heart was not there. And I right. was like that. I was like that wandering sheep and you know, God knew I was in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. I was out of fellowship with him. And when I realized how out of fellowship I was and how bad I had gone and how far I'd gone astray, I yeah. thought, God, you're, you don't even, I, I really knew in my heart. I'm like, I don't even deserve a second chance. You know, and yeah. I, when I finally understood that in my heart, it was like, wow. And then to understand that he did have mercy on me and he did forgive me. And yes, there was consequences for that sin. And I right. had to go through the consequences with God, but he did have mercy. And I got a hold of the depth of the, of my sin mm -hmm. and the depth of his mercy through him rescuing me when, you know, I sinned. We've got to look at that and remember that, you know, his, mer what is mercy's changed for us? It's changed everything. God's under no obligation, but he does all this out of the goodness of his own nature. And it's right. amazing when we see that. Um, but we had this, the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death. Oh, that eternal death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. What a wonderful verse. This explains to us what That's God has really changed. Good. He changes the decision against us since penalty that so great a death. You know, in John 3, 18, it tells us that those who, who don't believe are condemned already. We're born under condemnation, yeah. the Bible says. You know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He changes that decision against us. What a thing. And remember what else his mercy's done. He changes the disposition within us and doth deliver. So he delivers right. us from sin's power in our life. Like right. I mentioned earlier, we now have the indwelling Holy Spirit there. We've been made new on the inside and he's transforming us into his likeness. And we're not enslaved anymore. We That's have right. liberty now to follow God that we didn't have when we were under condemnation, mm. when we didn't have his spirit within us. And we can be conquerors. We can live, you know, that, that. A victorious life by putting on that armor of God. Like we talked about last night, pastor preached about that last night about the, the breastplate of righteousness and how mm. Christ is our righteousness. We've had that imputed righteousness. What a wonderful thing that our disposition yes. within us has changed. We're new creatures inside and there's something different. Amen. That's exciting. Yes. It he is. changed that. I could never do that. You could never no. do that. These are supernatural things that only they're God can do. They're miraculous. Changes. How do you explain that? You, you can't, can't explain that, you know, to, to someone who doesn't know Christ. But as we get to know him better and in a deeper way, we realize he had so much mercy. Look what he did. And then he changes the destiny of our soul. He changes us one day. We know we're going to be saved from sin's very presence. 
and says he right. will yet deliver us there in first right. Corinthians nine ten. How exciting. That's Even good. though we, you know, we deserve damnation, we deserve hell, yes. but yet he mm. puts us in, uh, in heavenly places with him. It says in Ephesians two, four through six, but God who is rich in mercy uh, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace, ye are saved and mm -hmm. hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So That's we're still good. living here on earth because we're still in our body, but our home address has changed to heaven. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. Yeah, that God yes. has had mercy. I do right. not deserve any of that. And so God has decided to do that. And there's some good reasons why he's done that. God has chosen to, to show us mercy because he wants to demonstrate the greatness of his goodness. Because he loved us when we were sinners, Romans 5, 8 says. But yeah. God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't say, you got to clean up your life. You got to do better. Mm. And you've got to earn my mercy. No. No, not at all. He had something, right. again, he gives. He demonstrates the greatness of his goodness right. by showing mercy to us. He wants to make us useful again. Like Second Timothy 2 talks about, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Well, we can't do that. We can't be sanctified apart from the mercy of God, mm -hmm. but he'll make us useful again. Mm. Just as we can't save ourselves from hell, we can't save ourselves from our noisy souls and from living, victor and we can't make ourselves live, live victorious Christian lives in right. our own strength. No. We can't. They're now God miracles. expects us to have, be responsible and do our right. part. But God, it, he does a supernatural work. We have to have, you know, a merciful savior who delights in rescuing us. And throughout right. our life, we're going to have to be rescued over and over and over again because Good. we are going to fail. I'm going to fail him again. I wish that I could say that I wouldn't fail him again. But I, I know too much being in the body of this death, like Paul said, that I'm going to fail. But I know God's mercy. I know he's going to help me. And, he, and he's given me that. He's going to make me useful and help me. You know, God places that responsibility on us. You know, he doesn't just say, you know, that we can just live any way we want to. You know, we don't get a light switch of just confessing our sin, like I was mentioning, and just getting his forgiveness to just assume that everything's going to go on without consequences. But he'll help me as I'm learning to say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you and I'm sorry. Right. And I want to get back on the right path. And so another thing why God has chosen to grant us his mercy is to fulfill the original purpose of our creation, to glorify God by fearing, loving, and serving him. So Revelation 4.11, we know that. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. To involve us in rescuing others from their miserable condition through the same gospel that rescued us is the next reason. Mm -hmm. He's got so many plans for us. And like we, again, Bible Baptist ladies, we read in Galatians 6, 1 this week, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one mm -hmm. in the spirit of meekness, considering thou thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So God wants us to be able to, to rescue others and help right. others in the body of Christ. And if we did this more, we're trying to do this in our home more, mm -hmm. you know, it's pointing out sometimes the sins and the things that we do where we don't realize, um, Sometimes that we're deceived or we're, you know, what we're doing really is sin, you know, and calling that out. Yeah. And if we'll do that in our homes, in our churches, again, that's not popular, but it's important. We can help one another yes. and we can please God in second Corinthians five eighteen, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And so he wants us to rescue others. And that's exciting that he wants us to be part of that ministry right. of bringing others to Christ and bringing others, you know, to, to, um, sanctification and encouraging that. Mm. What a great thing God's done. It's exciting. You know, we exciting. love him because he first loved us. We talked about that last right. week and we show mercy to others because he, he showed, showed mercy, mercy to us. us. But if we don't get a hold of this mercy, mm. we can be very hard on others. And then, you yeah. know, with the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. You know, God said, you know, he'll do that. But if we're mm -hmm. not, if we're unmerciful to others and we have this wrong idea of mercy and we're so hard, we're actually hard on ourselves because we're condemning ourselves at right. the same time. And then we live again with this anxiety and this yeah. stress and this misery and this guilt. And sometimes we can't figure out where is it coming from? It's right. coming from something we're believing right. that's wrong. 
And so these are just some of the things, you know, we're going to hit on over the next couple of weeks. We're going to mm. finish up the study in the next two weeks here, but just important that we get the right view of God because mm. sometimes we get the wrong view of God, either through just things yeah. that we've believed falsely or sometimes false teaching or places, you know, that we've been in our life where we've picked up these things and we got to figure out, is this biblical or is this not? Something's wrong. So we should have a response. What should our response to his rescuing mercy be personally? We should have that response like Luke 18, 13 says, like the publican, right? And the publican standing afar off would not lift so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote mm -hmm. upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And again, I know he has been merciful to me as far as salvation. He's been mm. merciful to me as far as sanctification. Oh God, right. I don't deserve this. Having a humble attitude and, and a yeah. right you know, view of my sin before him. And to realize when mm -hmm. I see his mercy, then I realize how much he loved me. And I, you're going to have, you know, you're going to realize how special you are, yes. how, how loved you are. But if we stay under guilt and we don't want to deal with our sin, like I was for a while, we can begin to think, well, God doesn't love me and he's not right. merciful and he's mm -hmm. being hard on me. We start getting a very warped, you know, view of yes. ourself and our warped view of God. And this right. really can, you know, work us over and we really become more and more miserable. And again, that downward spiral of unbelief mm -hmm. that leads to anxiety or anger that leads to despair. We start that downward spiral, but we have to, you know, come back up by by saying, God, I need my mind renewed. I need to put off this wrong thinking, mm -hmm. be renewed, and then start putting on the right things. Right. Just like it says in Ephesians 4, it's good. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Again, like we talked about last week, his love is our motivation, not fear anymore. When we have perfect love and we understand God's love for us, mm -hmm. we're not going to have you know, a, a, the wrong kind of fear that's forgetting everything and running. We're going to have the right kind of fear, which is facing everything and being reconciled or being restored, depending on, you know, if you need to be saved or if whether you just need, you know, sanctification mm -hmm. in your life. So God, that's his, my motivation is the love of Christ because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead and that he died for all that they, which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him, which died for them and rose again. What a blessing that that's what we have to live for now. And that should be the attitude of every, of every Christian. Yes, so when should. we see a child of God that just has no desire to live for God, you know, no desire to be in God's word, you know, and, and there's just something, mm -hmm. there's a disconnect there. We got to check up and say, if I have no desire to love God, yeah. you know, no, either I'm really, really cold and I'm really, really, again, out of fellowship with him. And I need mm -hmm. to check up because this is not normal. You know, know yeah. that it's not normal to be that way because when we live under Christ, we're going to have, again, not so much noise. We're going to have more peace in our right. soul. That's good. We got to check up though, because it's super, it's super important that we live, we're living unto him. That should be a natural thing. We should be loving him when we get a hold of these, these things. If we're believing right, if we're not experiencing this, there's something we're not believing right. We got to get back to the word of God and say, God, what am I not believing about you by faith that I should be believing because it's affecting the way that I'm living and right. the way that I'm acting and the way that I'm feeling. So when we recognize God's mercy and his rescuing in our lives personally, and when you've experienced that, again, with salvation, and again, sometimes maybe if you were saved at a young age, maybe you've seen it throughout your life in ways, again, like I said, when I backslid and mm -hmm. I saw God bring me back and rescue me, mm -hmm. literally from the, some decisions that if right. I had not turned him, if he had not gotten a hold of my heart, I would not be here today. I just wouldn't. Yes. My life would be so different. He rescued me more than right. once in my life. He's rescued me over yes. and over in my life as I see yes. him. He's had so much mercy we'll in so many different situations. That, then it should cause us to respond with a repentant attitude and take on mm -hmm. the resp responsible living, knowing that now we're representatives of his mercy to others around us. And we're part of the ministry to reconcile men to Christ. What like an amazing that. thing. That's We've good. got so much, but if we, again, if I don't see my sin as that bad, if I kind of brush it off or if I just don't want to deal with it and I just want to, again, forget it and yeah. distract myself and refuse maybe the, the correction of authorities like I did for so long. You know, my husband mm -hmm. tried to correct me about it. I was ah, 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 always wanted to push back against that, mm -hmm. you know, and fight back against it. But when I was doing that with him, I was doing that with God. 
And I right. really did not see the connection with that mm -hmm. until maybe, yeah, a year ago. And really over the last few months been getting a, a hold of that concept where it's like, man, I really need to watch that, you know, that I'm yeah. not just coming back, pushing back and being defensive or trying to minimize my sin, but Lord, that I sit in it for a while and just realize, you know, that I need that. Um, and if I'm not in God's word regularly, you know, and, and getting in there, then I, and then I won't be sensitive to his mercy and his love. And then I'm going to get hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Like Hebrews right. three thirteen says, I don't want that. Mm. Our souls will continue to be noisy unless we know that God is that God of mercy. You know, he's the mm -hmm. one who delights in rescuing us from our miserable condition. He never gives us, you know, what we deserve. Yeah. He's always, he always, you know, is merciful. He's he always, always with strength, you know, holds back on that always shows merciful. And when our heart is right, you know, and we just have that attitude of God, I'm sorry. And we're really, oh, I know I messed really up grieved. and we really, yeah, our heart is like that. God's like, I want to restore you. And then our soul can rest because God's mercy mm -hmm. is more That's than enough. Peace comes from. Right. In resting in these things, knowing yeah. that God's not out to get me, that he's not out to just slam me with an unmerciful, you know, yeah. like these, like the, the gods of mythology that you read about. You know, you see how they're, man, they're twisted up and selfish and, and moody and yeah. all this stuff. And it's like, that's not the God that we serve. God, okay, we have my yeah, God. a little God, you know, that's, yeah. messed, those are the gods that man is made up. You know, that's how man tries to bring God, you know, down to their level by making yeah. these maniacal, strange, you know, like mm. I said, moody gods. Our mm. God is not like that. The God mm. of the Bible. He's never he's, moody. No, he never has a bad day. <laughs> He never has anything he has to work on in his life. You know, he's always there. He's yeah. always merciful. He's always there, you know, to see us restored. He always wants our best. Like we right. talked about last week, he yeah. always has good will for us and that never changes. And I'm so thankful. So last week we talked about God's love is more than enough. Now we're talking about God's mercy is more than enough. Do mm. we believe that his mercy is more than enough wow. for us? Do we believe that? Or do we think, well, no, I just don't know if he can fix this mess that I've gotten myself into. Mm. I don't know if he can help me with my problems. Do we believe that? And so the next right. thing about God's faithfulness is it kind of goes along with it. So I'm trying to cover, you know, as much ground as we can over the next few weeks to finish this up by the end of the month. But God's faithfulness, God is also faithful. God's faithfulness is a subset of a larger attribute of God. You know, his immutability or his unchangeableness. Uh oh, I think I, I'm not. Man, I think I did it again. I'm not sharing screen here. Hold on. See if we can <laughs> do it again. I'm having all kinds of. All right. Yeah, let's see. Oh, well, I'll back. reread the first one. I can't. It won't let me. There we go. Yeah. God is also faithful. God's faithfulness is a subset of a larger attribute of God as well. His immutability or his unchangeableness. So God is faithful. When we say God's faithful, that means he's true. He's mm. worthy of belief. He's exact in conformity to the letter and spirit of the truth. He firmly adheres to duty. He's constant in the performance of duties and services. So God is worthy. I love that. He's true and wow. he's worthy of belief. Mm. And it's amazing. Um, I heard a really great little example here about faithfulness and how important it is to have faithfulness. Uh, a pilot, he has to set his directional gyroscope to the runway heading just before takeoff, you know, in these small bush planes like we had out in Alaska. Every runway points to a compass heading that is painted in large letters at the beginning of the runway. A pilot knows if he is taxied to the end of the runway painted with 36, that his plane is pointed at a heading of 360 degrees on the compass. And so he has to reach over and turn the knob there on, on his uh, directional gyroscope to 360 degrees. And that calibrates it to a known true heading of the runway. So he can find his way back. It helps him with the plane to be able to navigate. If he does not set that directional gyroscope, the farther he goes, the more off course he's going to end up being. And if the pilot doesn't set that, that directional gyroscope, he's gonna quickly find himself off course. And he's not going to be able to navigate his way back to the runway and he's going to be completely, you know, messed up. So the same thing can happen to, um, the same thing happened to the children of Israel in the Bible. How many times do the scriptures say they forgot the Lord, their God? Uh, they did not remember all his works. Uh, their hearts, you know, drifted from what they knew to be true about God. They got off course. 
and they brought about their own captivity and eventually their disbursement throughout the Gentile world. And so it can be the same for us today. Um, we've got to regularly recalibrate ourselves by mm. staying committed, you know, daily, you yes. know, to being in our Bibles, seeking to know God and by, you know, regularly being in church uh, where you've got gospel, you, you know, good preaching. Yeah. So you have that reset where we can hear God's word, where we can receive exhortation. We need one another. And that's something, you know, that we, I'm glad we've had zoom and some of these things to continue that, but I'm this excited so about good. being able to do that together, you know, personally yeah. very soon because <laughs> we need that with each other, yeah. you know, and that's important. And we need to be in our Bibles every day saying, God, what is it that I'm not seeing in my heart right, right. now that I need to see? I want to be, yeah. I want to be calibrated with you. If there's something I'm doing wrong, I want to mm -hmm. get it right. And the Holy that's spirit right. will show us if we have that attitude, but if we don't see, cause we get so busy and distracted that we don't have time for our Bible reading and to spend yeah. time with God or to recalibrate. We go out in the world mm -hmm. flying around, we're going to get off course so yeah. quickly. And that's one thing we've just got to do, especially mm -hmm. with now that things are starting to return to normal. Are we going to remember every day before I go out the door to work? Am I going to, and am I going to make sure that I've got my directional, you know, headings right, <laughs> that I'm set. So I'm not going to be off course by the time I get home from work today, but God, I'm going to stay with you today and I need your help. That's what he wants us to do. You know, mm -hmm. our hearts tend to drift. Uh, and if we're not reset, you know, according to that, again, unchangeableness of God, you know, his, his word, we're soon going to be off course in our thinking. And of course, then on our feelings, because our yeah. feelings follow our thinking and then our, our feelings, you know, um, you know, affect our actions. So yeah. no one can calibrate our spiritual direct, uh, directional gyroscope. It's God. It's a God given responsibility. And it's only our fault, you know, when we become uncalibrated because we're not choosing to look to God to look to his word, being faithful to, to the, the things that he's provided in our life to help keep us calibrated. Um, like, like, you know, our, like our local church yeah. and we can drift in our thinking, you know, in the area of faithfulness of God, when sometimes when things don't go our way, we go through a storm, you know, in our plane, we can think, <gasps> we tend to believe that God's <laughs> love has failed us, you know, and, and, and that maybe, or maybe, you know, he was a little short on wisdom. Maybe he forgot about me for a while, you know, um, he let something happen, you know, that made life difficult. And it's amazing how quickly we change and, or we can even charge God with something really foolish, you know, and, and we can think, oh, you, you've just been deficient, God, but God's faithful, mm -hmm. you know, and faithful means, you know, he does not change. And so what does it mean that God is faithful? When we say God is faithful, we mean that God keeps his promises. When he says something in his word, he will do mm -hmm. it. There's, right. You can mark it down. Yeah. You can chisel it in stone. He is going <laughs> to do his part. Yeah. A lot of his promises, though, are conditional. You know, He has a part for us to play in that. He's not just, again, going to just do everything. He wants us to learn to be responsible and to be obedient. But he always keeps his promises. He never fails. And you'll hear, mm -hmm. you hear many, many people, and I can testify to it too. He does what he says he'll do. He keeps his promises. He does not change. Uh, Lamentations 3, 21 through 23. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. We've got to remind ourselves of this fact sometimes and remember that God says that we can respond to life's ups and downs with and steady right confidence yeah. and we can be steady because we've got right. our, our directional gyroscope set yeah. to God's word. And we're going to say, God, I know that there's a storm right now. And mm -hmm. I know it feels like my plane is upside down right now, but according to the instruments, according to you, I'm still headed in the yeah. right direction, no matter what the world around me is telling me or circumstances Being are telling me. With him. Right. And so God is working these circumstances right. for our good and for his glory That's and to good. conform us to his image. And it's a beautiful thing. And so God finishes what he starts. God pays for what he orders. God leaves, never leaves us or forsakes us. He always forgives us. He always directs us. He always provides a way to escape temptation. So to change in any way would mean that God would have to change for the better. But he's <laughs> already perfect. So he doesn't have <laughs> he anything to work it. on. He doesn't have to change anything. Yeah. He doesn't have any internal battles, you know, with his personal characteristics or, <laughs> or with sin like we do. He does not have that. Um, he's a perfect God. And to get a hold of that fact that he is perfect and he has nothing that needs changing, that's hard for know. me to even get a 
across, you know, because I know how much I'm just thinking, really, you know, anybody <laughs> like, like that God's just so far above me. I can't, I can't get my mind around that. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, you feel the same way. You can't get your mind around God mm -hmm. and understand that, but God is just, he is amazing and he never changes. Yeah. And so he's faithful. And then what makes God so unchangeable? Well, God's the self-existent one. We know he has no beginning and no end. Again, how yeah. can we understand a God like that? Mm -hmm. How can we try to put him in a box or bring him down to our you level? Can't. No one made God. No one can influence him to mm -hmm. contradict himself. No one can make him do anything against his will. He is almighty God. He's the self-existent one. And God is the infinite one. He's free from all limitations. Nothing mm. that he purposes needs to be revised or rethought. He's not like, oh, I didn't think about that. Or I have to, oh, there's new information. Nothing's new. God knows everything. He has no need to change anything. And that also applies to his word. And that's why we can put such confidence in his word because it says he holds his word above his very name. Right. So his word, we have the Bible. God's not, we don't need any revisions or additions to the Bible. Mm -hmm. We know that. But he won't be sending us, you know, Bible version number two, you know, or something <laughs> that's better. We're, we're, yeah. I'm going to give you a sequel because when <laughs> God speaks, he speaks all he needs to say the first time. That's right. Because he does everything right the first time. He's not like mm. us where we see mistakes mm -hmm. and we do things. God never does that. He never makes wow. mistakes. He never changes. He is perfect. And trying to get, again, get our mind around that to not bring him down. Yes, he came to earth and, um, as Jesus, you know, and took on a human body, but that was still God. And he is perfect. And he is not like us. He is not like a man. And so trying to understand that is sometimes hard for us to get our minds around. So what does God's faithfulness do, you know, for us as his children? God's faithfulness fuels our faithfulness. Mm -hmm. So you're not, you, you know, we're going to be plagued by sins that we can't overcome if we don't believe that God is faithful. Like he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there are no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that she may be able to bear it. Notice that he said, you know, such the temptations that are common to man, not common to God. You know, God is faithful mm -hmm. and God says he will help us. Right. That's his promise. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. God's faithfulness fuels our faithfulness as mm. he's faithful to us, us, as we see the sunrise every morning, the sunset yeah. every evening, we see the seasons change. We see all of these things as amidst all the chaos that we're going through in our world right now. Yeah. We see the faithfulness of God all around us. That's good. Ah, oh, what a wonderful thing. And all of these promises that he gives us, you know, regarding our growth and holiness, you know, and righteousness, like pastor taught us about last night. They're based mm -hmm. upon the faithfulness of God. So right. if we don't believe in the faithfulness of God, that God doesn't change, that he always does what he says he's going to do, we're going to be very unsure of a lot of things. We can be unsure of our salvation and having our sins forgiven if we don't believe that God's faithful. We're going to be really easily discouraged by loneliness if we don't believe that God's faithful and that he's truly you know, yeah. everything that he says he will be to us. Um, when we trust in others, others are going to let us down. Mm -hmm. So, and we will be, you know, very lonely. We're going to be easily discouraged by our own failures if we don't believe that God's faithful. Because if we trust in ourselves, mm -hmm. we're going to let ourselves down. <laughs> yeah. Because we're man, where we can't trust ourselves. Our confidence has to be in Him. That's good. You know, we, we can be just tormented by fear mm. of what's going to happen if we don't believe that God is faithful, that God doesn't change, that God is the one that's in yeah. control, that He is infinite, that He's the one you know, that, that, that is in charge of everything. God's faithfulness gives us the confidence. Our confidence doesn't come from us. It's not yeah. a self-confidence. It's not a self-righteousness that we were talking about last night in Bible study. It's talking about the righteousness of Christ. Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our confidence. Christ is why we can yes. you know, hold on to him and be faithful. Right. So good. God's faithfulness fuels our faith. You know, we, we can't build a stable life spiritually while trying to believe in a God that we look as look at as unpredictable or scary, or maybe, you know, that yeah. he's not as personal to us. And mm -hmm. it, it's a problem, you know, and as you grow as, as a new Christian, especially you've got to get that, you know, established in your heart where God is really personal to you and you begin talking right. to him more. And, you know, again, he's not like these weird Greek gods and mythology that are, you know, unpredictable and selfish and, you know, even immoral and all these weird things. Mm -hmm. You read some of that stuff and it's like, wow, that's messed up. 
that's not our God. You know, God is yeah. always predictable. He's always, you know, his alwaysness where he's always the same. He never <laughs> changes. It makes him faithful. It makes him a right. God that we can rely upon. We don't have to worry. We don't have to be upset. We don't have to wonder what's going to happen. God's promises, you know, in his word are going to have a very little impact on us if we don't believe that he's faithful. Yeah. You know, our prayer life is going to have very little impact upon anything if we don't believe that God's faithful. But if we get a hold of this, his faithfulness, the opposite is going to be true. His promises are going to mean so much. They're going to have a huge impact because every right. promise we're going to believe it in our heart because we're going to know, oh, I can trust him. He's, he's faithful. <laughs> I know he doesn't change. And if he did that for, for, for Noah, he's going to do that for me. If he did that for Abraham, he's going to do that for me. We claim these promises and yeah. we know that they're true because we, we see the faithfulness of God throughout his word. Mm. And his promises, you know, have a huge impact on our life. We're going to be stronger, confident Christians, you know, and st stronger, confident Christian ladies through yeah. that. It's a blessing. It is. But if, you know, our sin, we don't want our sin to get in the way. Because when we don't, when yeah. we have sin there, that's what complicates it. Where we're like, oh, but I don't want to yeah. deal with this sin, you know. And I'd rather just go and just, uh And God's like, deal with that. You know, yeah. deal with it. Don't yeah. leave that stuff in your heart so you can trust me. So that that doesn't come between me and you. So we have this good fellowship and you're close to me. And, and you can realize my faithfulness yeah. and experience it personally in our life as he directs us. As he's there for mm -hmm. us when nobody else is there for us. You know, as only God can be. Yeah. Our prayer life is going to be vibrant as we learn mm -hmm. to depend upon God. You know, he's our rock and you learn that he's there, you know, and he's the one that brings you peace and comfort and strength. And, and we keep that repentant heart towards him. We keep, you know, we make requests of him, not demands, um, right. not, you know, we deserve it. Yeah. Not acting it. like I deserve it, but yeah. knowing I don't deserve it. And, you know, learning to pray the way God wants me to pray with my priorities, right? Where eternal problems I'm focusing Put that first. on that the most yeah. in my own heart. God, I need help with my eternal problems. Mm. I need help for these lost folks that are around me, whether it's my neighbors or, or friends Amen. or people. I need to focus on these eternal problems the yeah. most. And the temporal problems, I'm going to pray about those too, mm. but help me not to make that my main focus, God. That's That'll good. grow me. That'll That's help me. Very you know, good. to realize the That's importance of in, in mercy wow. and where God wants me to concentrate, you know, my mercy. So the two come together, mm. the faithfulness and mercy. And then, you know, God wants us, let me go back to Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. <laughs> wow. What a promise. A lot of generations. With them that love him and keep his commandments. Again, not hard, simple. Yeah. You know, obey him, love him. Uh, and what a wonderful promise. We can rest. We can have quiet souls when we believe right. that God's faithfulness is more yeah. than enough. And if we just take one of these qualities, attributes of God and get, to, get a hold right. of it, get a hold of it, whether it's his love, whether it's his yes. mercy, whether it's his faithfulness. Next week, we're going to be talking about his power and his wisdom. Mm. Any of these qualities, if you can just get a hold of one, let alone all of them. And there's so many more you can study out, you know, as, yeah. as you can see, as you look into it, it's exciting. He is more than enough. He is so deep. He is so big. <laughs> he is so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's more than enough. And we can spend the rest of our lives getting to know him. And we will throughout all eternity. Yeah. And it's going to be exciting. And so we That's can know good. him and he can be more than enough, more than what we need. If we'll just follow him, if we'll just realize that God, you're, you're all I need, not these other things. And yeah. getting, again, as the world begins turning, returning more back to normal, we're going to have to make that choice. God, am I going to continue to spend time with you? Continue to be revived in my heart? continue to seek after righteousness, continue to know that you're yeah. my faithfulness and you're the one I need to be turning to. And you're the one that needs to be my all in all, you know, not anything or anybody else around me. And mm. that'll be a good, you know, good thing. God wants us to learn that his mercy and his faithfulness you know, nice. are all that we need. So that's a blessing. So that's I'm glad so you guys good. joined us. And <laughs>